Hi everybody um, and welcome to this IFM webinar. Um, it's great to see so many people registering from across the world and I hope that we're able to provide you some, with some really interesting and thought-provoking content today. Um, the topic of today's webinar is Make or Buy. Um, it's been created to help organisations think about their strategy in relation to this really important area. Um, I just wanted to cover a bit about the Institute for Manufacturing um, before, before we start. Uh, if you haven't come across us, the Institute for Manufacturing is part of the University of Cambridge's Department of Engineering. We bring together expertise across management, technology and policy to address a broad range of manufacturing issues and challenges. Um, we've got really close relationships with organisations across government, industry and academia. Um, and I wanted to draw your attention to the practice element of this image. Um, and it's really to say that the research tools and approaches that uh, you'll, uh, you'll be hearing about and the, the tools today have been developed, tried and tested and enhanced in collaboration uh, with our organisational partners. Um, so if you're facing challenges or strategic issues, um, then some of these approaches might be useful to you. Um, I'm delighted that we've got uh, experts uh, joining us today, Paul Christodoulou and Andrew Gill, who have worked with organisational partners to deliver these tools. Um, and I'll hand over to them now to give some short introductions. Rob, thanks very much. It's Andrew Gill here. I'm an industrial associate with the Institute for Manufacturing. I've been working with IFM in that respect since 2005. I've done a lot of work on um, road mapping applications and also the application of this uh, make versus buy methodology and I'll be you know, looking forward to telling you more about some of the insights that have come out of that. Good afternoon everybody my name's Paul Christodoulou I, I have a very similar role to Andrew um, you know taking the outputs of research and helping to put them into practice working with partner companies through a knowledge transfer consultancy activity uh, my particular specialism is, is in global manufacturing strategy, where make or buy is, is one of the key elements. Um, and I've been working in the IFM, uh, well, in that field for ooh, about 18 years now. Uh, that's me. Rob, thanks very much indeed. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we will divide it into um, four sections, really. The first part, we'll, I'll give you a bit of an outline of you know, why a make versus buy strategy development might be important. Um, we'll have a little uh, vote then to see uh, what, are the, what are the reasons why you're interested in uh, make versus buy. Then I'll hand over to Paul. Paul will talk about some the toolkit that we've developed and some real world applications. Um, I'll then talk a bit about uh, the different business contexts that you might want to apply these tools in uh, and we'll have another little vote to, to see the business contexts that are of interest to you uh, and then we'll have an open forum summary and questions so we we think we'll take about 35 minutes over the the presentation and leave it about 25 minutes for the, the conversation so just starting on um, you know why make versus buy strategy might be important I, mean, I think um, there's been a, really some significant trends in the nature of manufacturing industry has been transformed over the last 50 years or so. There's a couple of significant trends. I mean, I think the first is that uh, companies have become much more global, uh, expanding internationally, you know, mix of greenfield investments and acquisitions. And secondly, they perhaps become more specialized in specific areas of the value chain and have increased their reliance on other specialists in complementary areas. So, you know, what were typically you know, vertically integrated firms in the 70s are now much more complex ecosystems of international specialist firms in 2020. And uh, these ecosystems, they're, they're complex networks of collaborating partners serving common aims and serving end customers. And um, the lead players in these networks they have to be quite purposefully about purposeful about how they configure those networks to optimize the flow of information materials and value uh, and it needs optimization of the value of partnerships constant collaborative innovation and ensuring sustainable competitive advantage through that um, and these you know, ecosystems are really only as strong as their, their their weakest links and how do companies navigate their way through that 
And I think some of these overarching trends, you know, we've perhaps moved from a world where people are thinking about products to thinking about solutions. What do the products actually do? Um, from where we're concerning about outputs, perhaps to more about the outcomes of the delivery of those solutions. From thinking in transactional terms to thinking more about the nature of the relationships within the network. And from thinking more uh, from a supplier context to one of really network partners. Uh, and finally, perhaps from thinking about individual elements uh, 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 separated from each other uh, to whole ecosystems which are working together. And, and this shift, if to be exploited, requires significant business model innovation and very different ways uh, to look at value. And um, I think one a very uh, interesting uh, model that's emerged from that is this simple principle of value exchange. And, you know, it, it, I think we're all very familiar with the idea of direct value exchange. That is, I make or deliver a product or service uh, uh, that you're satisfied with and, and you, you pay me for that. But the, 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 something that's emerged in our research is the concept of indirect value exchange. That is the non-monetary aspects, the intangible things. For example, the exchange of trust or the exchange of technological knowledge uh, or the exchange of uh, aligning strategic intent and other stakeholder needs. And perhaps particularly aversion or avoidance of risk. And in fact, it, it's quite clear that good and high quality innovation and new value generation doesn't come from direct value, it comes from indirect value. And in assessing the importance of indirect value, we need ways of being able to weigh up both the tangible and the intangible elements in making our decisions about who we partner with, who we work with, who we outsource to, etc. And the nature and the, the way in which those relationships work. Now, uh, just to get a, a feeling from, from the delegates here, We've got a little poll, which I think Rob is going to show, and I'll ask you there just to have a look at these questions. You know, why would you be interested in Mate versus Spy? Uh, and I'd ask you to pick any number of these, uh, and uh, we'll just have a look at how, where that sort of balance of interest comes out. And maybe try and do that within sort of 10 to 15 seconds maximum. Okay, Rob, I don't know, can everyone see that now, Rob? Um, uh, so just, have it, just to pass a, a small comment on that, I think there's one of the things, a couple of things that's come out there quite interesting, I think. Clearly the desire to reduce costs, but also this desire to reduce risk. And I think that that's quite interestingly uh, chimes quite, quite nicely with the, the observations we were just making about direct and indirect value. Um, Interesting perhaps to see that the uh, reducing the carbon footprint uh, and protecting IP are less significant uh, issues. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'll um, uh, now uh, I think we're going to pass back over to Paul who's going to talk you through the sort of practical application of the tools uh, that we've been using in this area. Great, thank you Andrew. I'll just elegantly share screen he says and continue by describing the practical toolkit we've developed and and maybe a few examples to illustrate these um, yeah the toolkit we've developed has two parts and um, the first part that we call the core analysis tool um, is it's, it's uh, a matrix that we use to populate the portfolio within a product or a product range or a capability range. Um, I'll come back to the dimensions in a second. But that helps us to um, understand some broad decision options around the, the four quadrants you see there. Um, it then leaves us with some uh, perhaps sensitive decisions and we've developed a second tool we call an alliance risk analysis tool where we can do a deeper dive consideration of 
supply chain risks to help us uh, to develop maybe more nuanced or subtle decision areas. Uh, so I'm going to talk through these tools one by one with some examples. So the core analysis tool uh, actually was developed by one of our senior researchers, David Probert, at the end of the 1990s. Um, it's a two by two matrix. There's no shortage in the world of two by two matrices, but we think this is a good one. We'll try and persuade you of that. Um, and as you see here, we've, we've, we're using it to um, analyze a portfolio here of components of a shower pump against two key dimensions. Um, so the vertical dimension is strategic importance, which says how strategically important these are to our offering as a business. Um, and then the horizontal dimension is supplier effectiveness, which is actually uh, uh, you know, saying how effective is the supply base at delivering these items. Um, it's a relative measure this, so to the right, the supply base is better, and to the left, we're better. Um, and, the, and the fundamental logic of the tool as a decision tool says, um, you know, things are strategically important and we're best at doing them, then it's an obvious make decision. Um, and the opposite quadrant, you know, I think is equally intuitive. It says these items are, they're, they're not strategically important. The supply base is better. Um, so, you know, it's a buy decision. Um, now, the other two quadrants are slightly trickier. Uh, the top right quadrant says these are strategically important, but actually the supply base is better than us. Uh, so this is sort of risky. It's a bit uncomfortable. Um, you know, these are important for our business proposition, but some external party has the capability. It's an area where typically alliances make sense, but, but also where we might want to do you know, this secondary risk analysis, which is the second tool. Um, and then just to complete this, the final left bottom quadrant, also uncomfortable but for different reasons. So this is items that are not strategically important, but we're the only ones who can do it effectively. So we're sort of lumped with these. We don't necessarily want to have to invest in these. Um, and over time, we might decide to coach suppliers, to develop suppliers to do this for us, um, which is interesting because it, in principle, it says that we're moving the items from left to right to make the supply base better, uh, which sort of suggests that this is quite a dynamic tool, uh, which is one of the reasons we think this is you know, particularly useful. What we do with this tool is we use it to populate where we think the portfolio sits um, at the moment, and then consider how we might move things over time to optimize that portfolio. So just to underpin that principle that this is dynamic, let's just consider what happens if we do nothing. You know, if we do nothing, um, then our competitors are competing away our advantage. So things will tend to move down, um, but also suppliers are constantly getting better. So things will move to the right. So if we do nothing, then everything gently floats down to this bottom right hand corner. And we've sort of left ourselves with a commoditized um, offering, which is, you know, it could be worrying. So the, the converse of that sort of dynamic effect is that you know, through our strategic intent and positive actions, we can uh, move these into uh, the optimum places. Um, if things sitting in the top left, uh, there may be core competences we can invest in further. Um, if things are in the bottom right, then we might invest in low cost sourcing. Um, as I mentioned in the top right, the typical area for strategic alliances, you're know, more sophisticated than the arm's length purchasing that you would do in bottom right, you know, maybe joint development, maybe exclusivity. Uh, things in this quadrant may be so important that we decide to acquire them. And then that in principle is moving things from right to left. Things in the bottom left, as I've said, we could develop suppliers as a quick route, which is divestment, which we've seen in a number of our applications where you can ring fence a business area and maybe sell it to a contract manufacturer. Um, and interestingly here, you know, the other option is because things gently decay in competitive advantage over time, it may be we can reinvest in them. It may be things have floated down, we could reinvest in product features or production capability and move them back up. So, you know, again, the way we use this tool is to populate the matrix and then to think about where we might move things 
and that sort of visual output then under underpins a, a make or buy strategy. So that leaves us with two key questions about this two by two matrix. So the first is, you know, what level should we think about doing the analysis? Uh, and the second is, how do we assess the two major dimensions? Um, so on the first question, well, let's just consider this as a, you know, based on a real example of plate heat exchanger, uh, which is a, you know, an industrial product about the size of, of this room. Um, and it's used for pasteurizing milk or dairy products. But when you look at the outcome of this analysis, there's two different things here. There, there, there's components like gaskets, slabs, frame parts, accessories. But there's also processes, so plate pressing, assembly, painting. So what should it be? You know, is it components? Is it processes? What, what is it that we should be analysing here? Um, now, uh, to help with this, we, we, we created a universal definition. Uh, which we call the work package. We think we should break this down by work package, uh, which is essentially a process driven unit of analysis. Um, and, and it says that you know, each of these is, is a process that transforms materials into an intermediate or end product. Um, it, it has to use a specific process technology, which, which is interesting because if we've got two different technologies, say for making slabs, then they're different work packages, they may end up different places on the grid. And they must be, se they must be separable. So you know, we need to be able to physically outsource these items. Um, but interestingly, we can do this analysis you know, pretty much any level. It, it's scalable approach. You can do this you know, at a subcomponent level, component level, processes, end products, even at broad capabilities or functions. And, and Andrew will talk a bit later about you know, the, 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 the more varied applications outside manufacturing where we think about using this approach. Um, but, but often in the manufacturing environment, we'll find that there's two key areas which, which, which are of particular interest. Um, and here's an example um, from a, 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 an application on, on fridges, uh, where on the left-hand side, you know, we, we have done this at component process level. You'll see there's components like evaporators, PCBs, condensers, but there's also processes, cabinet fabrication, cabinet foaming, uh, etc. Um, and this is you know, what I call within the four walls of the factory analysis, and it tells us more about the level of vertical integration that we want to pursue. Um, whereas on the right hand side, you know, we also often do this at product category level, if you like. Um, so in this instance, you know, some of the more differentiated products, upright freezers, small chest freezers, maybe core in make, uh, but top freezers, um, you know, under counter freezers, less differentiated, we might outsource those to contract manufacturers. Uh, so that's more of a portfolio strategy approach. And as I said, there are many other ways we can think about this, which we'll come back to later. On, on, the, on the remaining question, you know, how do we analyze these two dimensions? Um, well, David Probert provides some um, guidance in his research. Strategic importance takes a little bit of thinking about. There's three key factors, uh, the, the impact on customer value. Now that says, you know, how important are these in delivering benefits to customers, which takes a little bit of thinking through. Um, but if, if we take the impeller, for example, you know, why does the impeller score high? Uh, that, that's because in a shower pump, uh, you know, it, it's having an impact on the power of the pump um, and on the efficiency of the pump. You know, all things that customers might value. Um, we also consider profit generation as part of this. So that says some of these items might support a premium pricing um, because of their advanced functionality. So these, these things link. Um, but also in here, some of these items, we may be able to deliver you know, at very low cost. And if we can combine those two of you know, high value and cost, then you know, they're more important to, to our shareholders. Um, and the third, the third factor is around intellectual capital. So we may be able to embed um, IP you know, in terms of, well, hard patents or, or, or just soft manufacturing know-how into these, which you know, sustain our competitive advantage over time. So that's strategic importance, supplier effectiveness, possibly a bit more straightforward. But, but remembering that this is a relative measure, 
So we use these three traditional you know, performance criteria and say, how well is the supply base, or how good is the supply base at delivering this compared to us on cost, quality, delivery? Uh, and we add on innovation because you know, often certain suppliers will be investing more or be more capable than us in innovation and we ought to factor that into the analysis. And what we typically do when we apply this is we set up weighted scoring matrices against these criteria and use that to help us uh, you know, make it as um, repeatable, scientific um, uh, and calibrated analysis as possible but also you know, accepting that we're relying on a little bit of judgment within cross-functional teams in, in populating this matrix. Um, this, now the second tool, just uh, to, to add to that, you know, I mentioned already, I think it is particularly useful when uh, items sit in the top right, because by definition, these are risky. Um, and so we should be very careful about whether we outsource these or not. Uh, there's also things that maybe sit close to the cross wires or, or actually indeed anything we think is sensitive. And this secondary tool um, does a, a little bit of a deep dive against certain risk considerations. It has a default that says, if we were to outsource this item, you know, what sort of risks might we um, uh, 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 come across? Um, so the, the key questions in here, you can read a little bit better. But just to mention before I get there, you know, and, 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 and the feedback loop here is to then use the outcome of the risk tool to then help us make the decision, you know, where do we move it to? And particularly here, you know, will we move it left and bring it in house because it's high risk? Or are we happy to contain the risk and mitigate it and keep with some sort of alliance solution? Uh, the key questions within the risk, uh, the risk tool you can see here, uh, you know, this is a mix of different things about innovation risk, competitor risk, supplier risk. Um, you know, again, it says that, that if we were to outsource a certain item, how high would the risk be in terms of creating unacceptable increase in the supply chain, developing supplier power, risking security supply, maybe the cost of supply development's too high, uh, maybe, maybe reversing it would be too difficult and, and that, that's too much risk to, to entertain. Um, we might lose this capability as a competitive differentiator. Uh, we may uh, you know, create a new competitor <laughs> um, through suppliers, which has happened you know, in a number of industries. Um, we may lose transparency of supply chain. We may in, in fact decide we need some of this capability to leverage suppliers. Um, it could negatively impact our innovation capability if we outsource, or we could have problems with brand reputation or IP leakage. Uh, and the way we use this tool um, is we've developed a simple traffic light tool uh, approach uh, where, as you see here, this follows on from the AT Exchanger example. Three work packages we're assessing on risk here. The first one, um, you know, it shows if we consider outsourcing, um, in this case, I think, continuing to outsource CAT skits to a specialist model in China, you know, we would have quite some significant risks around supplier power, security of supply, development cost, um, innovation capability and IP. Um, and actually this analysis then, uh, you know, the way we use this tool is we, we score the risk, anything that's amber or red, we then consider some sort of mitigating action or capture a comment if mitigation is not feasible. And then we look at the overall balance of the, you know, the color pattern and the comments and we use that to make a balanced decision. But in this case, the risk was so high that we, you know, we decide to, to look towards insourcing. Whereas with the assembly work package, uh, the risks are you know, more medium, it's green and amber. Um, and we decided here that this was medium risk and we could take a dual approach. In, in main markets, we might do this in house, but in emerging markets, we could outsource to assembly partners. Uh, but we may take certain sort of risk mitigation actions with those partners to offset set some of these risks. You know, it might be some sort of confidentiality agreement, et cetera. Uh, and finally, you know, on the last example, on the slabs, low risk pretty much everywhere. This is an area where we would probably go out to competitive tender and source at lowest cost. So that's the risk tool. You know, in coming full circle, we then uh, build the, 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 the result of that back into the two by two. 
so it says gaskets were moving left actually it will require that and take, bring that capability in house assembly we're prepared to go both ways on that with certain constraints and slabs is you know more of a low cost sourcing opportunity um, so this two by two matrix populated with the vectors on you know is a visual make or buy strategy which is which is actually very useful for ongoing communication uh, so that's the tool set. Um, these are some of the places we've applied the tool set. Uh, you'll see very, very different manufacturing environments, business environments. You know, some of these discrete products, some of these are more process-based industries. Um, some of these we're focusing more on manufacturing, some a little bit on R&D and engineering and broader capability strategy. Um, so it takes a little bit of work to tailor the tool set to the context. Uh, but it's you know it's a universal tool set that pretty much works uh, in, in any uh, in any business setting. Um, so let me just hand back to to, to Andrew now, and Andrew's going to talk a bit more about you know some some other ways we could use this tool set. Andrew, back over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so um, Paul has given us a a great review of the way the tool can be applied and um, we've for, I think because a lot of work has been done in this area and it's easy to understand we have used a example of a, a physical product in the sort of manufacturing production environment but it, it's worth having a think about much wider possible applications outside the direct production environment and right around the value chain and I think one reason why this is important is many companies, for example, are considering enhancing the service level that they provide, maybe providing services associated with the products that they manufacture. You know, at a, a corporate level, uh, for example, you know, if you think about Apple, they don't actually manufacture the products, but they're and around the value chain. They've got shops, they've got music, they've got design. You know, they have wide aspects of the value chain. And if you're trying to reposition yourself in the value chain, there's huge swathes of capability that you probably don't have. And how you access that capability uh, needs quite a lot of careful thought. And similarly, you know, if you're thinking at the business level, what sort of capital investments should you be making? What should our partnering strategies be in response to that, that corporate level of strategy? Where do we need to look? How do we find out the things we really need to look for great partnerships in? And at the capability level, what are the things which we really are important to us as our core capabilities where we have value and what do we need out of our partners in order to make the ecosystem which we're a part work or it can be at the product level you know and there's huge power for in that uh, around aligning the product portfolio with those core competencies or developing your category supply strategies and, and then at the factory level looking at investing in advanced production capability or looking at developing low cost supply sources and um, in order to tackle some of these uh, uh, outside the factory questions uh, we have developed uh, a more nuanced version of the four box matrix i mean why have four boxes when you can have nine it might be the comment that one could make now this actually is the same chart um, with supplier effectiveness increasing to the right and strategic importance increasing to the left and many of the, con the conclusions are coherent but so you know in the top left three boxes uh, indeed here where we're at least as good as alternatives and it, it is important then we look at maintaining investing or consolidating our capabilities here in the top right where it's very important but alternatives are better this is where acquisition may come in or where you might be looking at some joint venture um, in order to make things work. Similarly, actually, the, the whole partnership context here is really in the field where it's moderate to low importance, but others are at least as good as we are. Uh, and in this here, Paul touched on already, examine your options in the circumstance where you're really good at it, but it's not very important in the business you're in. How do you monetize that? if some uh, capability falls in this area. And it's also interesting to know that outsource and commodity supplier here, they're not being applied to stuff that's great strategic importance. 
they're being applied to things where clearly third parties are better uh, but they're of less relative importance and I think that's getting the terminology and understanding there can be quite quite important um, and another way to think about this and so it's good to go back to a four box model at this point if you think about different markets that you're in or you might be looking to uh, to uh, attack uh, then uh, you know why might you be looking to do some kind of make versus buy analysis so if you if you see yourself uh, against your current competitive position whether it's weak or strong on the bottom or your knowledge of the players and the customer requirements on the vertical clearly if you're in a strong competitive position and have good knowledge of customers and requirements you you're really looking to make sure you've got the right partnering and enterprise approach uh, that you've got the right value alignment uh, and, and you can assess the impact of perhaps disruptive new entrants who could come in uh, but on the other hand if you're in the bottom left box where you recognize you're in a weak position and a low current knowledge you might be looking to see well what new partners have we got who could strengthen our position and our knowledge and where can we get new ways to innovate because clearly if we're in a weak position we're not innovating there today so the focus of what you're looking for in the analysis might be very different and, and similarly the top left box there where you may see yourself as weak today but you actually know the market quite well you could be looking to how you could be the disruptor how you could be putting radical new value propositions on the table um, and you may have a portfolio of markets that you're in and so you might be using different things uh, doing it for different different reasons okay so just with that uh, kind of thinking about the different levels at which you might want to uh, apply to make versus buy tool I think we've got another little poll here which Rob can can help us with just be interested again in the 10 to 15 seconds just pick the which which of these uh, all or none uh, are areas where you might consider using a make versus buy uh, approach Okay, oh, I think now still clicking up. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, that's very good. Thanks very much. Now I think that is quite interesting. This I the, the the focus there on doing the capability level, looking at core and non capabilities, and looking at partnering requirements. That that squares quite nicely with the drive for improved innovation. I would say uh, being a key aspect of what really delivers value. Um, no, thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, I think um, we can take up some of those themes uh, and I think Paul, uh, Rob, you've kept the, the results of the voting so we can refer back to them later. So I'll just now uh, come back to the summary of our points that are really a couple of slides that uh, uh, Paul's going to share now and then we can get into question and answer. So Paul, over to you. Great, thanks Andrew. Yeah, just for you to wrap up and look ahead here. Uh, yeah, I guess there's a sense at the moment that we're on we're on the switching point, possibly between different eras in all sorts of respects, but particularly in you know in the development of global supply chains, we've had this you know era of maybe 20, 30, 40 years now, where there's been this drivers of globalization, people chasing low cost labour, more fragmented supply chains, etc. Um, you know, a sense that that's been drawing. To a close over the last few years, um, you know, perhaps the whole um, uh, the, the whole COVID experience has sort of accelerated and accentuated that, um, and gives us an opportunity to you know take a fresh look at how we develop global supply chains, um, but not to forget that you know we have these issues about sustainability, climate crisis. We've got these huge changes people are talking about coming from digitalization. And that's not to mention all the sort of Trump Brexit geopolitics going on. Um, so, um, yeah, watch this space. Uh, you know, what, what is obviously disruptive and, 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 and difficult times. Um, but, you know, it's an opportunity for us to start rethinking about how we're going to develop these 
structures and systems in the future. Make or buy strategy, I think, is a key element of that. It's not clearly not the only element. We should be thinking about location. We, sh we should be thinking about your know, risk um, and, 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 and sustainability, clearly. Um, but, you know, it's one key element. So um, we're, we're just setting up some research around these themes now. And if anybody uh, would like to get involved in that, you know, please let us know. Uh, but interesting times ahead. So I'll um, hand back, I think, to Rob now, who's just going to close off, and then we'll invite a, you know, an open Q&A session. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul and Andrew, for that really interesting um, presentation. Um, just before getting on to the Q&A, and um, please note, uh, put all of your questions into the Q&A section for Paul and, and Andrew to answer. Um, we've got some... Uh, pre-submitted questions which we'll also be asking. Um, just wanted to highlight um, how you can get involved or if you're looking for further support, um, please uh, get in touch. We're happy to have calls um, to discuss how your organisation might be able to benefit from IFM research and our practice activities. Um, we have a short online uh, open course on, on this make or buy uh, tool which is taking place on the 7th and 8th of July. Um, we'll send out details about that in uh, the follow-up email alongside the recording and other supporting materials. Um, and, and please get in touch using the uh, email uh, that's listed uh, at the bottom of that slide. Um, so on to the questions. Um, the first one that I had, which was uh, pre-submitted, um, who should be involved in determining make or buy strategy? Who'd like to answer that? Yeah, I can, who should be involved? I, I think it's interesting um, if you look at the two by two matrix. I don't know, if, Andrew, you can just toggle back to the main two by two matrix as I'm talking. But um, it, it sort of helps us to think about who should be involved. You know, we typically work with cross functional groups to, with, as I say, with, with, with weighted scoring matrices against each of the axes. Strategic importance, the vertical axis. Um, yeah, who, who, who can help us with that? Who can help us with customer value, uh, uh, profitability and, and intellectual property? Uh, and what's important there uh, and interesting is that we, we, we should really have the voice of the customer in that discussion. So that means, you know, commercial marketing people are involved in that. Um, it, it, because there's IP and, and, you know, other more technical issues, we should probably have uh, R&D people and engineering people in that. Uh, as well as you know, manufacturing and, and procurement who would be traditionally involved. So that sort of presents itself as you know, a full cross-functional mix of expertise that we really would like involved in, in judging strategic importance. Supplier effectiveness tends to be you know, more of a discussion, <laughs> a negotiation between manufacturing and procurement people who tend to often have polarised views as to who's better at stuff. Um, but, you know, through that, through dialogue, uh, and capturing um, you know, accumulated wisdom within the organisation. I think you can, you can get to pretty repeatable scoring on these, uh, which, which, which is robust. Um, you know, data sometimes helps support that, costs, lead times and things, but there are a lot of non-quantifiable things in this picture, where, so you do need to bring data, hard and soft data together. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. Um, one question that's been submitted in the three by three matrix, I didn't get the difference between the central quadrant and the top right, uh, top right quadrant in terms of strategy. So could you explain a little bit more on that? Yes, yeah, I'll just get back to that slide. So ask the question again there, sorry. In the three by three matrix, I didn't get the difference between the central quadrant and the top right, top right quadrant in terms of strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. That's a quite. That's it's a good question. What's the difference between? I think is the, that's the question. Is what's the difference between partnering and joint venturing, for example? Now, um, there really is uh, a spectrum there, and, and this does reflect. By the way, it reflects on another question that was asked about how how do you actually work in in that kind of environment? There's a spectrum of the degree of intimacy between the parties. So, um, in, in, in the top right-hand end of the spectrum, you know, in the, that top right box could be acquisition. 
I think we physically, you know, actually go and buy a third party, and then you can integrate that as closely as you like. Um, in the partnership box, you've clearly got two completely separate legal entities and need to work out how they're going to work together. Now, what's interesting, I think, about that is there's, there's really three elements in the way that partners work together to deliver value. Now, the top one is to create value. How, how, what, what is the value proposition you're putting together? The bottom is value delivery. Is that, you know, having understood customer needs between you, how are you delivering that value? But the middle, if you like, is the risk management. It's actually how you share the risk. Because if you're working together, you have a different risk profile than if you're working alone. And you need to be able to monetize that risk, understand what it is, and build into your contractual arrangements how that works. Now, the extent to which you shift from the middle box to the top right box is the extent to which you move in that model by, 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 by managing the risk between, you know, if you, if, you, if you make an acquisition, then you effectively have all the risk uh, under your control. If you have a joint venture, you would probably have shared equity and therefore shared results. But if you're in a commercial partnership, you're then looking at somehow about profit share, revenue share, etc. And it's, so it's about, about how you set up the degree of intimacy in the commercial relationships that enable you to build the trust and innovation that's necessary to deliver the capability mm -hmm. and deliver the value. I, hope, I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. Re that relates to another question that I saw come up on the sheet. Yeah, Andrew, I was just going to add to that and refer to that. The other question that was the one from from Daniel Fantoni. You know, it was similar on a similar vein, but it's saying. You know, for items in the alliance risk quadrant, um, you know, other than buying shares or arranging marriages between directors and being important volume wise to the partner, is this just a question of re increasing reciprocal trust? Otherwise, aren't alliances just a matter of momentary convenience and thus intrinsically fickle? Which is, yeah, very good and, and points to some of the things Andrew's already said. But, um, you know, just to add to that, yeah, I think there are some tangible things you can do between those extremes in, in setting up alliances you know, uh, where, where you can build into supply agreements, long-term supply agreements, you know, joint development of new technologies. Uh, you, you could uh, uh, you know, link that to uh, exclusivity rights um, and, and have um, you know, non-compete agreements and, and, and tighter NDAs. Um, you know, that might lead to some sort of investment and that's the next stage. Where you might invest in them, or and, and, and or take a JV role, or then move to acquisition. So there's there are sort of tangible. There's a tangible spectrum there. I think where sophisticated partnership agreements um, sit somewhere in the middle. Hmm. Yeah, I just add to that. I think this thing about are they fickle? I mean, a lot of these yeah. are quite long-term relationships, and and partly when you start off on a long-term relationship a bit like a marriage, you might not actually know where it's going. And so uh, if, you, if companies embark on these things on the assumption that it's short term, it really is not the right behavior to fit into this sort of top right middle box because uh, you won't build the trust if it is seen as being short term. You know, they're mutually contradictory. So it's a kind of long term journey. And how you set up commercially to do that when the factors that determine success are probably primarily non-financial uh, is, is, is very important. And so it's building relationships, of course, is, is vital in that context. Mm. Thank you, Andrew and Paul. Um, we've got a question that was pre-submitted. Um, how has the COVID-19 crisis affected the make or buy decision process? Do you want to take that one, Paul? Yeah, so, yeah, a few comments there. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's affected it maybe indirectly and maybe directly in some ways. You know, of, of course, everybody's now um, you know a little bit more risk averse, um, and uh, there's a lot of talk about um, resilient supply chains. Uh, so some of that's about location more than make or buy. You know, it's about reshoring, um, but it's also about control. Um, and certainly, you know, that, that could lead you in your make or buy analysis to 
uh, tend to bring things more in-house. And in fact, if you look at the, our risk tool and the questions within our risk analysis tool, you know, some of them point to that. Some, some of them say, um, you know, there's risk of loss of supply chain transparency or loss of security of supply um, or, um, you know, of, of, of unacceptably long supply chains. Uh, then you, you, you know, the tendency is you might bring things back in house. So I think that you know there is a direct impact on your make or buy approach, which, which uh, in principle you know, drags you back to a not just a sort of reshore perspective, but to an in-source perspective. So yeah, there is there there is an impact. Yeah, I, I, no, I'd, I'd just re enhance that, and I think interesting environment concerns have driven things in a in a similar way. Um, and uh, desire, you know, there's suddenly a whole new paradigm around risk that perhaps people hadn't even got on their radar screen, which can shift the lines around on these charts quite a lot, actually. Um, uh, there are other issues with risk in that um, if someone's much better than you are, you're running a risk if you don't use them. Uh, but, you know, uh, the proximity it can be very powerful in handling uncertain and changing in situations. Yeah. Yeah, maybe can I, I just point to, I've just noticed another very interesting question. Co common, uh, common issue that comes up is David Corrigan's question with industry partners you work with, how successful have you found the approach to be regarding completing a more holistic view of supplier effectiveness versus just the cost of goods pricing based on quotes? Yeah, I mean, it's a classic challenge we've found. I, th I think we, <clears throat> we, we, we like to make this distinction between what we call tactical make or buy and strategic make or buy. And yeah, I think it's perfectly okay to uh, go out and get competitive quotes um, for things you do in-house from suppliers and use that as a part of tactical make or buy. Um, you, you know, you may, it, it may be a temporary basis to... Uh, reduce cost or to offset sort of capacity limitations. Um, but, you know, we, we think strategic make or buy uh, needs to be more holistic. Uh, you, you know, the consideration of um, a, a broader perspective of supply effectiveness helps. You know, so it's not just cost, it's also innovation and delivery and quality. You know, because there's lots of added, uh, added cost and non-quality that companies have experienced by outsourcing too much, but also considering strategic importance, I think has a you know, very considerable impact on, on, on those decisions in that, you know, if, if things are higher on the two by two, you know, you're much less uh, willing to move things right. You know, just because they're lower cost externally, you know, you might be moving core capability out, um, hollowing out your business, possibly creating a competitor or leakage of capability to competitors. Um, and, you know, you could argue that's uh, short termist and, and uh, you know, a threat to your long term business proposition. So, um, yeah, by, by all means, if things come out low on strategic importance, let's consider getting things at lowest cost as long as it's quality and delivery, uh, etc. But if things are high up on the chart, yeah, let's take a much more holistic view of that in terms of our longer term business proposition. Yeah, I'd, I'd just I'd add to that actually, uh, Paul, I totally agree that, that really focusing your efforts on the top part of the chart. Is, and also the definition, supplier it makes you think of one thing, but there could be people who ought to be on this chart who aren't even on your supplier list. You know, they, they, if, if they, they may be, you know, uh, people with that standing digital capability that you're looking for, you're not even working with today. They might be your customers. They might be, in some circumstances, your competitors. So actually, throwing it as wide, understanding as wide as possible who it is who ought to be on this chart, and therefore what, how that affects your strategy, is also something that's worth putting a lot of thought into. Um, and again, you know, the risk goes up, but it, it has the maximum impact. If you think about those things, the higher up the chart you go. Thank you, Paul and uh, Andrew. Um, so, uh, another question that was pre-submitted. 
Um, how should companies decide make or buy, uh, buy options by lean philosophy? Do you want to take that one, Paul? Yeah, it's interesting, actually. Yeah, you know, the, the 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 relationship between lean philosophy and, and make or buy. Um, you know, if you read the machine that changed the world, the Womack and friends, which is the sort of foundation of lean philosophy. Um, you know, they talk interestingly there about how lean and outsourcing actually go very well together. Um, uh, and they talk about the automotive industry uh, and how it switched actually you know henry ford well, everything was totally done in house uh, because he needed to do that to join everything up in in automated production and that was the foundation of his business model extremely successful of course but later on you know toyota and others uh, took some of those principles and then uh, built on them with with a lean philosophy which actually said yeah we're going to outsource more we're going to focus on key things that we think are core to us, which you know, might be engines or bodies and, and assembly. Um, but actually, we're going to outsource seats. We're going to outsource um, control panels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and the, the reason that goes well uh, with, with Lean, I think, is because outsourcing is, is forcing you to clarify interfaces. It forces you to standardize. Um, and that all goes well with this sort of tiered outsource supply chain in automotive. But just to add that, you know, we found that that doesn't necessarily work well in all environments, it, particularly uh, in sort of fast moving of, or fast changing engineering environments, like for instance, aerospace, um, where, you know, tailored engineering means that if you create too many interfaces between partners, then your response to change and your quality assurance processes and, and your agility, uh, it can be diminished. So in that sense, you, you, you know, you've got to be very careful that you don't move to an inflexible, lean-based outsourcing approach where you, know, you, you, you actually kill your, your agility. Fantastic, thank you, Paul. Um, Andrew, I think you've got a question from Graham that uh, you wanted to answer. Yeah, so there were a couple of questions really, I think, relating to startups and, and scale up, which I, they, they just provoked a bit of thought. Um, these, these things are a journey and indeed there's a huge asymmetry of power between small startups and large companies. And uh, it's a whole, it could be a whole topic of webinar and, you know, years of research in itself. Uh, because, you know, if, if you rely on partnering arrangements and legal constructs as a small company, um, you haven't got the lawyers, you haven't got the firepower when it goes wrong and someone steals your IP. Um, and I think there, but therein, if, if you have a dilemma as a startup, uh, or an SME who's looking to grow, if the access to growth needs partners or needs third parties. You know, if you go back to the other two by two matrix where you maybe uh, have low credibility but a high knowledge or you want to be the disruptor or you're in the you know, low credibility and low knowledge. And, and there I think, I don't think there's a substitute between establishing good real trust and personal relationships. I, th I suspect that smaller companies, and I'm not an expert in this, and Paul might call me more, smaller companies will win by continually being agile. And if the larger companies try to steal their IP, the chances are they're like dinosaurs and they won't make the most of it anyway. So fighting in the court compared to sorting things out and having good relationships. And as far as this the Apple story, indeed, they did start making the Mac and they made a complete hash of it. And they must have gone through a process at the strategic level, at the corporate level, of thinking, what is our real core competence? It's designing and conceiving of products and services. Right, we'll set ourselves up looking at make or buy approaches that deliver that. But they had to go, I think they were reading Steve Jobs' autobiography. They went through a lot of pain trying to make their own uh, and ended up realising that that wasn't really where they were good at. I don't know, Paul, if you want to chip in on those. Topics. Yeah, no, I fully agree with that. And it sort of links to a couple of other questions we've had there. 
one about the implications for SMEs with lack of technology and structure. Um, you know, and I'd agree that uh, you know, often SMEs have that advantage of, of flexibility and agility, um, which, but that implies probably that they need you know, a, a lot of partnerships and partnership capability. Um, but as they grow, you know, they're going to have some key decision points as they scale up. Um, and I think this, this can help this approach to think about you know, what, what, what are we going to need to have in our top left quadrant uh, and what are we happy to partner on or outsource? Um, and and you know, maybe um, you know, Apple made that decision uh, uh, consciously and, and through painful experience, but, but ended up outsourcing a, 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 a lot of their manufacture. But they for sure decided that uh, you know, software and, uh, and customer interface and, uh, and, and all that uh, sort of softer stuff was definitely in, in top left in the core area. Um, we would just to quickly um, capture one other question that said, you know, could you apply this tool set to a software company? Uh, and absolutely. Um, you know, I think you, you can absolutely do that. You take a bit of care how you define the work packages, but you know, I think software engineering, um, uh, you know, all those areas and, and even just the broad capabilities of any business. I did a bit of work <laughs> at one point with a, a company that ran a bakery and they wanted to do a make or buy strategy because some things they were really good at baking at and did in house and some things they got from, you know, a network of supply partners, which was, um, you know, cottage, cottage industry. So yeah, even works there. Um, so yeah, software for sure. I think you can, you can think about this in, in the software company. And just one other add-in to that, of course, relevant for SMEs is they can get the funding. And you can always acquire the people rather than acquire the company. And uh, bringing expertise in-house through human resources strategies, you know, if something's really in the top left box, you know, that's part of the investment is the people investment. It's not just the technical and the hardware investment. It's investment in people and processes to get your capability out. Yeah, yeah. And, and just as a, a final question, one uh, pre-submitted one, um, what are the current trends in outsourcing versus insourcing and offshoring versus reshoring? Yeah, I guess I, I, I hinted at that earlier, you know, for, but, but, but actually even before the whole COVID thing, um, you know, there was a lot of indication that um, there, there's uh, reshoring going on. Um, you know, a number of drivers, I think, behind that, um, which, which sort of coincide. You know, one, int uh, of course, sustainability uh, and, you know, reducing air miles and transportation miles is one. Uh, you know, one is the need for more customized products, uh, which, which tends to drive things, you know, drive manufacture close to the point of sale to, to enable that tailoring uh, on, on a fast re response basis for sure. Um, you know, other things going on as well, like uh, new technologies, additive technologies, digital printing, um, you know, Philips lighting have, have launched fairly recently, you know, a, a, a totally different distributed manufacturing model um, where they you know, have a web portal, you go on, you design your own lampshade, um, and it's digitally printed in a factory um, which isn't in China. It's it, at the moment. It's in I'm, it's in it's in Holland for the for the for the Dutch market, um, and uh, you know they 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 digitally print the products and they assemble them there, and they deliver them to you you know within seven days. Sometimes with your own tailored design, um, and that's fantastic. So yeah, there are there are certainly reshoring trends. You know, are there insourcing trends? I think the two sometimes go together a bit, uh, but you know, there's strong arguments that you should be continuing to partner, I think, but just making sure you've got the, the right partnerships. Um, but there's, you know, there's always core things that you should be in, uh, investing in, in, in house and, and that, that will sustain. Mm. And Andrew, anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I think uh, geopolitical risk. I mean, if you draw up a list of the places you might think to go, and then tick off how many of them are absolutely geo, geo, politically stable and not going to be subject to some sort of trade war in the future. On the one hand, I think then the other thing is, you know, here we are today, the ease of communication 
Uh, so oddly, um, physical items, I think there's a significant drive around the pressure to bring closer to home physically. But actually intellectual content, it, the, the, there's huge enablers to that going possibly the other way. So I don't know, I just throw that out there as something to think about. Communication technology might mean that intellectual property gets increasingly globalized, but geopolitical uncertainty gets to mean that physical property gets increasingly localized with the other things, with the technology, etc. So almost an opposite direction of flow. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'm just looking at the time and that's the uh, end of the webinar. Um, really interesting um, questions from everybody. So thanks for uh, those that have been submitted. Um, close off the webinar by saying thank you very much to everybody attending and Andrew, Paul for giving your insights today. Um, if you've got any support or want any kind of further conversations, please get in touch.